uh, morning, Evie. Morning, everyone. Um, and Richard, we'd just like to, as investors, extend our uh, condolences to uh, uh, Bot um, and to all those working at the Hemlo Mine. Um, I'd like to try and catch up some time, Evie, if possible. Um, but uh, 29 minutes to cover virtually everything in the industry. Uh, we, we, two years ago, we met and uh, we called the bottom. Uh, balance sheets have recovered, dividends have been reinstated and growing. So uh, uh, I guess the obvious question is, where are we in the cycle now? <laughs> um, yeah, I think that was a, a, at the time, Jamie, that was a bit of a brave call that we made back then. Uh, we were in the teeth of the, the storm, I think. Um, it was December 2015. So I think, as you say, things have dramatically improved. Um, we've had, um, I think, if you, when people look back actually at, at the second half of 2015, they probably will see it as a, a much needed catalyst for change within the industry, um, where you know the, I guess, the pain of the mistakes of the prior cycle um, came home to roost, uh, and we've now seen you know widespread adoption. Um, of capital discipline being talked about um, by company management teams, significant deleveraging, um, and you know the, the 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 quality of the companies right now, uh, in terms of the I guess the risk profile, of, in our view, appears to be much much higher. Um, and I think without um, some of the balance sheet leverage that we've had in the past, um, the underlying volatility or the risk. Um, that investors um, have baked into these equities is lower. So for us, we're at a kind of confusing point in terms of multiples. You know, we haven't, we've seen a, a multiple compression um, for a lot of the companies when actually the businesses, in our view, look less risky. So we, I think one of the things we're expecting uh, over the next kind of year or so is an expansion of multiples um, to reflect the fact that the businesses are, uh, are doing what they say they're going to do. And I think that's really in the hands of management. If management can deliver on the promises, um, if they can deliver on the capital returns that I think investors have been waiting for uh, for a long time, and with the cash flow generation that the companies are now generating, it, it's, it's within their decision-making process to be able to hand some of this money back and be sensible with regards to the capital allocation. So that's what we're looking for for the next stage of the cycle. Uh, and I think that will reestablish trust and it'll bring people back into the sector, rotating from other areas. Uh, and I think that's what we need to see over the, over the next 12 months. So I guess from that is the, the, the culture has really changed. You, you, you really feel as though it's now embedded that uh, we do have a, a, a new set of people here and they are committed to the long-term change in this culture. And we're not, yeah. moving, we're not going to move back despite some of the uh, improvements that we've seen in the last uh, uh, two years. Yeah, I, I, I think it's never say never. Um, and this sector... Uh, done it for 23 years, and I think that leopards don't change their spots. Um, and you know, we've been through a period of, uh, I guess, of feast in terms of capex. We've now been through a period of famine. Uh, and I'm sure that mining companies, as they naturally eat their ore bodies, um, will start to need to reinvest again. So I, I, I'm not kind of naive enough to think that the capex is going to remain low forever. But I do think we have a window of opportunity over the next kind of 12 to 24 months. And I hope it's at least 24 months where we can get some big money um, coming back to us. We're already seeing share buybacks being announced by companies. We're seeing dividends increase. And I think there's room for a, for a lot more of that. And I think that will really help heal um, the relationships between investors and, uh, and the companies. And, and I suppose all part and parcel of that is that we've got two new chairmen at the two of the largest companies. Um, and third one being discussed openly in the press at the moment. Uh, perhaps give us some insight as to the conversations you've had with the new chairman. Uh, and maybe any other comments you can you, you, you can give as to their, their future strategies? Yeah, I think it has been a time of change in the industry. Um, we've had new CEOs coming in, um, as, as well as new chairmen. Um, and I think that um, some, of the, some of the things that we've been discussing with them have all been around the points that I've touched on earlier. So it's around uh, making sure that the industry um, sets itself up to attract capital. Uh, and, to and therefore they have to deliver on what they say they're going to do, they have to be stewards of the capital, they have to be sensible with regards to its allocation, and we need to have transparency. You know, one of the things I think we talked about two years ago was a need for openness amongst the companies, that if they are going to make investment decisions, they need to share with us the returns they're really going for. Mm -hmm. It's not good enough to just say this meets our hurdle, and therefore they just make the decision. I think we need to have much greater clarity uh, around what, we're, what we should expect 
uh, as investors. And there's no point having crazy commodity prices to try and achieve mm -hmm. rates of return to justify an investment. We want to see growth in value per share. We don't just want to see growth in volume. So I suppose uh, of, of all the old economies, all the old sectors in the world, mining is probably one of the oldest. Um, a lot of the old uh, industries have actually changed strategies and inspired uh, with a lot of these new corporate strategies into the modern world. Um, with new, new boards forming at these major companies, um, do you feel as though the boards of these companies are well equipped for the modern world? And also, if there's anything that you would like to say to them as to how to progress and move into a new, into take on technology, and Richard's obviously uh, previous uh, uh, presentation on tech, a lot of which is progressing technology into these major companies, is there anything that you would suggest they need to do differently? Um, I think, this, I mean, Barrack has made a, a lot of the progress that they're looking for. I think there are other companies adopting different ways. You know, we've got one of the companies in our portfolio, they have um, these kind of hackathons that they hold internally and externally, so they, they send out solutions or uh, well, they send out problems to, to universities um, and post them online, and they look for entrepreneurial solutions to that in certain time frames in these kind of hackathon competitions. I think, you know, that's just brand new. Mm -hmm. um, and it's amazing some of the things that come back from that. And, and when we speak to management teams, you know, the examples they give us of some of the things that have come up, the innovation, things that they would never have thought about internally, uh, it's good to kind of push the boundaries to try and achieve that change. <laughs> So I think that's you know, a, a side edge. Obviously, technology is going to deliver significant inroads into productivity, you know, whether we have automation, you know, those kind of things, uh, ho hopefully enhancements in exploration um, as well. I think there's lots of, uh, lots of IP going in that direction. So you know, we, my colleague and I are going to go and visit a, one of these exciting new exploration groups in the early part of next year um, to see their technology. So yeah, there's, there's lots of change, and I think it's, um, I'm looking for, for positive results on that. Excellent. So um, moving maybe a little bit into more specific sectors, uh, the gold sector, uh, where there's been obviously a lot of management change as well. The reserve lives of a lot of these major, major gold companies have shrunk to what some in the industry would call critical levels, uh, partly as a result of shareholder pressure themselves to drive um, uh, productivity, deleverage, improve returns, etc. Um, how do you see the industry resolving this without actually reverting back to previous? We all know that grades are declining generally. Uh, new discoveries tend to be that much more complex and uh, need to be obviously be larger with the obvious capex. Hmm. So how do, we re how do we resolve the reserve crisis while at the same time not re reverting back to uh, previous uh, bad habits? Hmm. Well, I think it, you have to be afraid not to produce less. You know? And so I think if you can produce less and you can be more profitable by producing less, um, then the industry will resolve itself because the deposits that will need to be developed to add to create production for the future, they will be developed under a higher price scenario, which will allow those to be developed economically. Just developing them because you've got access to money doesn't seem to be a sensible um, thing to me because I think it, that we've seen the, the track record of the industry has been mm -hmm. so successful in destroying value over many, many years. Um, if we can avoid that mistake just on its own, um, then the returns will improve um, for investors. So I think that, that's probably the main thing that we'd be looking for. And from an, from, from, from an investment point of view, how do you position yourself with your funds uh, for the impending change of gear, so to speak? Uh, yeah. So we, we look for themes uh, in our portfolio. So you know, if you can have a business that is able to replenish its reserves and its resources on a regular basis because it's got an expiration culture, uh, inside it uh, and has a successful track record and deposits and properties they have have optionality that allow that to take place. That is much better than just going and, and buying things generally. However, M&A has also been successful and there are a number of uh, examples of companies that have bought assets or projects at the right point in the cycle and have generated huge amounts of value. The trouble is most assets get bought at the wrong point in the cycle and they end up being written off. Uh, and there are some brilliant examples of that. Um, but so I think you know, that's one of the themes, resource and reserve replenishment. You know, avoiding companies that are investing just to stand still to keep production flat is another one, um, because I think that's a kind of, that doesn't get you anywhere. Um, and then we are also looking for companies that have a, 
you know, an innovative culture, um, and, they're not, and they're prepared to manage risk in their portfolio, uh, to manage the assets to best get the returns. Um, you know, we don't really want to have spreadsheet mining. Uh, just because the MPV mm -hmm. is best if you throw loads of money at it and shorten the life, that's often not the right way to go and develop an asset. You know, having, you're giving yourself more time to get a, get a window where the commodity prices are going to be good, that actually doesn't say it's a, the right decision on the spreadsheet, but it's probably the right decision from a common sense point of view. And, and, and other themes that might happen, I, I noticed from a, 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 maybe a bit out of a date presentation of yours, is a district, district, district scale uh, exploration themes where they've where they've developed and got to a certain several. Is that something which is current, current in your thinking? Yeah, so we've, over the last year or so, we've definitely been adding to the tail of our portfolios. Yeah. Uh, and you can see that in some of the literature we've published on this. Um, so we've got you know, a number of what we call, I guess, high growth juniors, um, both companies that have the ability to, to provide assets that other people might want in the future. Um, they have control over districts or regionally kind of hot exploration uh, areas as well. So we have been populating the portfolio with those that the, hopefully towards the low of the cycle. Um, that's without doubt been a theme uh, for us. Um, and I think that, that you know, the best opportunities there have probably passed um, because we're you know, so much up, up off the low. However, it's really pleasing to see some of these companies coming through and the actual work on the ground delivering the results. And we had you know, a great example of that this morning with one of our investments um, that came out with this you know, fantastic exploration results. So you know, I think there is, the, the work is starting to come through uh, and we are seeing the kind of projects of the future being generated, uh, but it'll still take time for that to, to show in production numbers. And is, is that global, or is that specific to geographies? Uh, it's very much global, yeah. Global. Yeah. Uh, so we've got, I mean, I, we, because of time, we're going to do a few quick fire questions um, <laughs> and get a few, uh, uh, I think, uh, hopefully a few interesting things. So can mining stocks ever be long-term investments? Absolutely. Um, <laughs> you know, there's, uh, I think, you, you know, you, there are some, You've obviously got to be able to sleep well at night, so you can't have everything in, the, in a sector that's highly volatile. Um, but absolutely, if, if the businesses are managed well, you get a mix, you get a strong total return with a great mix between income and you have, the vo I guess, the volatility or the cyclical element of the, of the share price move. If you're compensated for that volatility with a good growing stream of income, then you can accommodate that risk. And so I think absolutely they can be good investments. So as a subset to that, and having spoken with your mentor over the last uh, few days, uh, Graham Birch, he asked if I could ask, if I gave you $100,000 to invest in the sector, and it had to be invested in 10 years, and it's not allowed to be the BlackRock Mining Fund, uh, what type of company would you consider buying? Well, if you exclude the BlackRock World Mining Trust, um, that's a pretty difficult choice. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, I obviously I'm not allowed to give out names. Um, but what I think, type of company? I think, you know, when thinking about the commodity space, um, there are a number of things to take into consideration. Uh, one of the things that I think that's, that is really important, that gives you a kind of tailwind advantage, is if you can have strong underlying demand growth for a commodity. Um, and if you can have that, that, accommodate, that commodity is probably more accommodating for, take, for allowing new supply to be, to be brought on in the market and therefore growth in supply and therefore growth in value on a per share basis. So right now, one of the areas that's obviously very hot uh, is the kind of battery materials space, which does look as though it's got strong um, demand growth um, that will accommodate that, uh, that growth in supply. So that would be an area that, or a theme that I would try and back, um, that kind okay. of commodity theme. Okay, so we're going to come back to that. We're going to leave 10 minutes. We've got um, five minutes to complete these other bits and pieces uh, because I think a lot of people want to talk about this topical subject at the moment. So a few very quick questions. Will, you, uh, will cryptocurrencies be the downfall of gold? Wow, that's, a bit, that's, that's an hour on its own. Um, it can I, be a yes or no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I was interesting the other day reading about one of the, the gold funds out there that's now allocating 5% of its portfolio to, to Bitcoin. Um, I'm, I'm no expert on this space. Will it be the end of gold? Um, my colleague Tom and I were talking this morning about um, a group called Glint, where you can now load a credit onto your telephone, and you can choose that credit on your telephone to be funded by you know, dollars, pounds, euros, or gold. So you can now go into a coffee shop, and you, know, and you can put your phone over the, over the receiver, and you can pay for your coffee in gold. So I think... I don't think Bitcoin is going to be the end of gold, but I think gold's going to find a new way to, to kind of re-establish itself, and that, to me, is a very sensible one. Okay. 
Will you be considering an investment in asteroid mining? No. No, I was rather hoping to spend an hour talking about that. Um, do you consider, uh, going slightly the other end of the scale, do you consider EBITDA an appropriate metric uh, given it excludes depreciation in such a high capex industry? Um, yes, we do. Um, but we really look for is free cash flow. Um, so that's, our, the, the, that's the main thing we focus on um, because I think that's the, at the end of the day, that's, we have a decent chance of sharing in some of that. Yep. Um, we don't have a chance of sharing in EBITDA. Yep. Um, so I think the free cash flow is the one that we really focus on. And obviously that relates to your mm -hmm. yield at your own fund. Yeah. Um, is uranium the new zinc following Cameco's decision to temporarily uh, suspend MacArthur River? Um, we haven't revisited uranium. Okay. Um, and won't be in the short term? Um, never say never. Uh, is anyone interested in diamond stories anymore, and should they be? Absolutely. It was great to see <laughs> Prince Harry giving a diamond engagement ring. Um, so um, I think, yeah, I don't think um, it's at the end for, for diamonds. Far from it. Um, I think the, the, but you have to be very, very selective. Um, I think you've got to choose the um, companies that have deposits that are going to be able to survive during the cycle. You know, we've been through a particularly rough time. Um, in terms of demand in the sector. You know, share of wallet is definitely decreasing. I think the biggest challenge in the diamond space is the lack of spend to promote underlying yeah. diamonds. And I think that when that m marketing was turned off many years ago now, um, the damage has been done. I mean, the junior people on my, on my team, you know, who are you know, 23, you know, they've never heard of a De Beers mm. advert. Um, they, the concept of giving it or receiving a piece of diamond jewelry is totally alien to them. Uh, it never doesn't even you know, think about it. So um, it was fascinating. One of our graduates did a survey of all of her peer group inside BlackRock the other day, and the results were pretty depressing. So the marketing is needed. Sounds like we need to put a fund together for Olivia and Hannah to get it done. <laughs> um, diversified majors of a market cap of more than 500 billion. Uh, the associated role sector accounts for just $2 billion. Um, the equivalent in the precious metal space is 90 billion versus a royalty space of about 32 billion. Do you see an opportunity emerging for more uh, non-precious royalties uh, coming to the market? Yes, I mean, there's a lot of speculation at the moment about um, where the next kind of royalty company is going to come from. Um, so it'd be interesting to see if that speculation turns into reality. Um, but I do think that there is a role um, there. I think the where companies get their capital from to develop assets these days is there's a narrower group of people to speak to. And um, the, the capital provision, ranging from equity through to all forms of debt, uh, including streaming, um, has become very, very segmented with different buckets of return. And I think in the, in, in the non-precious metal space, there is an obvious gap right now um, in terms of providing capital in return for royalties. Um, so I do think there's a role for that. I look forward to, uh, to hearing more from that. Uh, it's certainly from the gold perspective, it's been an exciting uh, mm. uh, space and, and a source of much needed uh, investment, obviously, from the gold uh, uh, developers. So poor old exploration. Uh, Chris Hind was talking just before uh, um, Richard, and he highlighted the number of explorers has fallen by 50% in the course of the last, I think, eight years. Um, do you believe institutional mining funds, where a mandate allows, um, has a responsibility to fund exploration, given it directly supports uh, the long-term growth cycle of the major investments you make? I wouldn't say it has a responsibility to fund exploration. I think it has a responsibility to try and deliver a return for its investors, for its clients. Um, and if the business model of an exploration company is justified, um, then there's absolutely a role for exploration exposure uh, inside a portfolio. Um, and as I said earlier on, you know, we have been increasing the tail of our portfolios to include more juniors, more explorers uh, over the last kind of 12 to 18 months. Um, so absolutely, yeah. Okay, and, and, and slightly from that, and with 32 years of experience in the sector, is that right? 23. 23, Jamie, 23 yeah. sorry, 32, I got the numbers correct. the wrong way around. That <laughs> uh, must be my 32. Um, with 23 years of experience, and particularly with the bear market that we had, with regard to the parameters you put about your investments within focusing on a junior miner, whether it's gold or mm -hmm. any uh, other commodities, what changed as a result of the lessons you learned over the cycle? In terms of what we look for? In terms of the parameters before you make a decision to invest in something uh, which is not based on typical cash flows or whatever. So in other words, an explorer or an early stage develop, uh, developer. Yeah, I mean, I, we, we tend to back junior exploration companies where they have the chance to become you know, significantly bigger and therefore allow us to deploy capital 
with that company through its life cycle to, be able to help them develop the asset. So to, if the prospectivity is, is relatively small, um, you know, it's, it's decent prospectivity, but the, the asset size is gonna be, could be relatively small, and that won't fit our mix. So what we really want is, you know, I guess, elephant country. Yep. Um, and you, to be able to kind of companies that have got an interesting concept, um, you know, they've done the initial work. We're not the kind of pure greenfield um, backers. They need to actually have something tangible uh, that we can do some work on to make the investment decision. So if the, once they've got those initial results coming through, you can see that something might develop. Uh, you know, we've got um, you know, a specialist geologist on our team who's been, who does a lot of that work for us. We've now got another graduate um, as well uh, helping us there. So it, we've staffed up to accommodate the additional exposure uh, that we've now taken into the funds. So it would, be, it would be unreasonable not to talk about regulation in the investment industry, uh, given we're just about to have a equivalent of Big Bang in the 1986, uh, starting on January the 1st. So just a brief question on MIFID II. Uh, to what degree um, has or will, because it doesn't start officially until January the 1st, will MIFID II have on your ability to source information uh, or change your habits in investment decisions? Yeah, so th th obviously there's going to be huge change um, in the kind of broking and analyst community as a result of that. So you know, one of the things we've done is, is expand our team uh, in response to that. So you know, we've hired you know, a dedicated analyst um, mm -hmm. to the team um, and we're you know, in the process of you know, doing uh, another, filling another role uh, in, that, in that regard as well. And I can see us adding more uh, in time. So I would expect headcount um, to rise um, and to, for fund managers the likes of BlackRock to bring more research uh, mm -hmm. in-house. I can see that happening. Um, I think obviously you'll probably see a narrower group of, uh, of firms in the sell side, mm -hmm. probably see consolidation um, taking place. Um, uh, and I think that's gonna be a big change. From all of the press that I've read, uh, it looks as though most people are you know, taking the research cost onto their own P&L um, as well. Um, and you know, that's gonna focus the mind um, um, in terms of wh where it gets spent uh, even more than it was in the past. Um, so, because, yeah, so I think that's going to be something that's going to change. You might have more specialist research projects as a result of it. You know, boutique, pure research only houses that don't have banking relationships. You know, I can see more of those um, cropping up as well. Mm -hmm. But I think for, for people who, are, who don't have the ability to be able to, to add the headcount, I think it might make life a bit tougher. Interesting. Um, I think there's a, clearly it's the, 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 the regulators are trying to push the mm. quality of research and the lateral thinking of research mm. uh, uh, up. So, yeah. and, and I think it's pretty much the first time, except for CSAs, uh, it's really been addressed for almost a generation. So, uh, interesting. So now we're getting on to the really interesting bit, uh, uh, which I'm sure a lot of people are talking about with regards to battery matters. And we could, I think, literally talk for the rest of the day on that. Uh, you've been an early investor and strong proponent of the sector. Uh, the basics of the uh, positive evolution um, were further underlined not only last week uh, when it was announced that global electric car sales were up 63% in Q3. China, in fact, doubled in Q3. Uh, and, even, and I think Librem yesterday uh, announced a new piece of research increasing their uh, numbers quite dramatically. I think uh, new car sales from 6% to 11% will be electric in 2025. Um, Perhaps you could give us just some general feedback um, that you're hearing and maybe some of the new trends you're, you're hearing, uh, whether it's on the supply side or the, or the demand side, uh, with regards to the new battery technologies and the other proponents that go on to make up this sector. Yeah. So I've, I've just returned from um, seeing clients over the last two weeks around the world. And the one thing that's come out of those meetings is that I haven't, we haven't yet met a client who doesn't think there are going to be more electric vehicles on the road in the future. Um, and so therefore there's obviously you know, a wide held uh, belief that this is a trend that's worth backing. Um, I think that's probably the, the first point. I think from going around the world you see different um, regulatory uh, environments, you see different, um, I guess, ecosystems that can support this or have the ability to support it with it and how much investment's gonna need to take place. I was in um, Taipei uh, last week and when you go through the streets of, uh, of Taipei, um, there are people driving electric scooters now um, around where you go to a, a 7-Eleven store 
And outside the 7-Eleven store is a, is a kind of, instead of having a newspaper rack or you know, racks having fresh fruit, there are one with, with rechargeable batteries um, there. And you pre-book it uh, with your mobile phone. You arrive, you wave your mobile phone in front of the thing. The, whatever the battery is that you've booked gets released. You pull it out, you open the seat, you change the one out, put it in, and you're, and you're fully uh, off to go in, in a matter of seconds. Um, so yeah, it's definitely happening. Um, you know, where, wherever we go, there's more recharging stations and, and so on. Even my local service station uh, in Wiltshire uh, has now got a Tesla uh, charging point in it. So I, I do think this is a real trend. Um, and you know, as, as you said, we, we did start backing this about two and a half, three years ago uh, in the portfolio. Uh, and you know, to date, it's been good. I'm also extremely conscious of the fact that I've seen many cycles come and go. You mentioned uranium earlier on, whether it's rare earths. You know, there's been loads of really hot commodity environments that have caused price spikes, only to see those retreat, you know, going back into mineral sands um, uh, yeah, yeah, many years ago now. So um, we're very conscious of that. So we've been backing companies that we think have robust enough economics to be able to survive a price correction, because I'm mm -hmm. sure prices won't go up in a straight line forever, and there will be very nervous times. Um, so we've got a handful of investments, um, about seven, uh, seven or eight investments today uh, in this space, um, where they're either in production, which is where most of our money is, is allocated, or ones that will be in production very soon. And then we've got a small number of um, ones that will be in production in you know, two, three years' time into the future, but have you know, potential for huge uh, change in valuation. So um, that's the kind of, I guess, the strategy we've been following to try and, to, to try and accommodate this. We've also spread the commodity mix. Um, you know, our first area was in lithium. Um, you know, we've added to that uh, in terms of cobalt, uh, and most recently, um, a small exposure in, in graphite as well. And we're looking at some other commodities um, um, that, um, that are also out there that could benefit from this trend. We also, and, and the reason, one of the reasons why we're early on this is because on the team, you know, we have a new energy fund, uh, which has been going now for 16 years. Uh, and that was originally set up with renewables in mind and so on. And that, and that fund has been very, very early in, in spotting the, the changes in the automotive sector, which has really raised this to our attention. So we have them to, thanks, to thank in terms of kind of inspiring us to, to get in this, into this space early. But for me, when I look at the underlying demand growth for some of these commodities, you know, we need to see supply expansions that are just enormous. And this, the, the track record of companies bringing on production you know, on time and on budget in the mining industry isn't great. So I think uh, even with the kind of proposed supply growth, there will be disappointment. Um, and I think the quantities of money that are being invested by the consumers uh, of these materials is enormous. It's, it's bigger than is being invested into supply right now. Uh, so that gives me confidence that, you know, even if a supply arrives, it will find a home. Uh, we don't know whether the price of lithium is going to be higher in the future or lower in the future, but we're pretty confident that the companies that we've backed are going to be able to produce profitably at prices substantially below where, you know, long consensus long-term prices are, are estimated to be. So, so I guess this really comes down to the three key things of any speciality chemical, which is quality, cost, and time. Mm. Uh, obviously, time in terms of filling out the supply chain. Um, and from my own experience, and uh, I'm a director of Bacanora, but from my own experience, uh, looking at a pilot plant and, and, and then going through the whole process, changing the flow sheet to make sure that we, mm -hmm. we get it absolutely right. Um, producing the right quality is obviously key. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the moment, anybody, anybody, any, anybody looking for materials just getting quality, they're just getting product. Mm. But ultimately, when things settle down, it will be what is the right quality, uh, few impurities and things like that. Mm. Um, and obviously, to, make, to get the impurities at that level, it all comes down to cost. And obviously, reagents are extremely expensive. They've gone up dramatically in the yeah. last 12 months particularly. So this is an industry that uh, speciality chemical hasn't really come necessarily into the mining phase, yeah. the mining investment phase. So you've obviously got to adjust your um, skill set internally to some extent. But also, I guess, just to understand the fact that this has a huge potential to disappoint on the supply side. Mm. Uh, in order to get all of this uh, 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 addressed over this huge ramp-up period. Mm. Do you see the inclusion of spodumene, which is an absolute requirement at the moment, which is easy to get out there, an obvious route to, result the, to resolve the oversupply? Or do you feel as though it's now becoming so heavily spodumene that, to the extent of the response, 
that actually we need to really focus on, 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 on alternative uh, metals and, and go through the whole way through to processing at mine site. I don't know if that's a very clear way of asking it. Yeah, there's, um, a big, there's a big push on the spodumene side now, yeah. uh, which is obviously the higher end of the cost curve. I think it's, that's because it's needed. Yeah. Um, so there's a, there's, a, there's a, from the consumers we speak to, there's a fear that we might not see enough supply to be able to meet the demand um, that will come from the investments that they're making, both in terms of range of auto automotive vehicle, uh, vehicles, but also the manufacturing capacity of the batteries. And we speak to those. So one of my colleagues was in China two weeks ago, going and seeing all of the battery companies there. Another of my colleagues was in South America, um, going and in seeing all of the producers uh, of lithium um, as well. So you know, we're trying to cover all parts of the mm -hmm. of the the whole chain, I suppose. Um, and yeah, I guess the conclusions from that is that you know we're very comfortable backing upstream in this space. You know, I think if you looked at the solar industry. You know, it's a, in an interesting comparison, you know, massive increase in demand um, for solar, huge installate, amount of installation around the world and growing incredibly rapidly. But the people making the solar panels don't make any money. Um, and so you've seen widespread commoditization of the unit that goes into mm -hmm. um, the device. Um, and the people, a lot of the people making the returns are actually the developers mm -hmm. of the sites. Um, and so that's where the, the big share of the economics is. You know, I think that you're going to see in the battery material space you know, maybe a similar trend where uh, unless somebody comes up with a unique battery chemistry that makes their, you know, their, their um, product just the must-have, you, know, you will see widespread commoditization of batteries. Um, and you, but the raw material supply that goes into it, you know, the chemistry is going to change as, as people come up with uh, better solutions. But I think as the big share, uh, A, one of the big shares of the, of the economics is going to sit upstream um, from the battery companies. And then you'll see the automotive groups just fighting for market share. I also think you're going to see the automotive space change dramatically from people wanting to own cars to transportation as a service. Um, where you'll have pooled vehicle fleets with much higher ca capacity utilization than we're used to today. Um, and you just the need to own a car, especially in an urban environment, will be far lower. Um, so I think that, that will change. And then you've obviously got automation with the, you know, driverless cars. So again, that's going to uh, change again. So I think it's so early to think about this. Uh, so, so, so I suppose there were two follow-on questions from that. One is being, there's clearly a move from lithium carbonate to lithium hydroxide coming on at the moment. Uh, that is what we're experiencing talking to the Chinese people while I, with regards to Bacanora. So do you see that moving beyond hydroxide to lithium metals, lithium fluoride, lithium hydro, uh, and, and other materials? Uh, I just As see it changing. Yeah, I just see it changing. I, d I don't know what the chemistry of the future is going to okay. be. Um, I don't think anybody does. Um, I think it's just going to be a constantly evolving process with more and more performance characteristics um, that people will be looking for. So whether it's cycle times, recharging speed, whether it's a whole, whether it's weight, um, there's going to be a whole range of different things that are going to be that are going to be part of the value chain for the end customer with regards to batteries themselves. Um, and and I, I think it's too early to say uh, in, that, in that response, but the, the manufacturing capacity that's being built today, I can't see lithium being removed as part, as, a, as, a, as, as a, an element going into that uh, within the next five to 10 years. And with regards to power packs, w uh, with regards to homes and everything, uh, talking to the groups that you've spoken to, lithium still part of that? Uh, clearly it's not gonna be 100% of that uh, like an auto, but uh, still part of that? Yeah, I think our work shows that it's much more, you know, for, for grid storage, lithium's not part of the solution. Okay. Um, I think, yeah, that large scale just, it, it doesn't need to, to be so. There's, there are other commodities that are early stage. You know, vanadium looks very interesting from, from, that, from that point of view. And that when we were doing some work on that. Um, but like all of these commodities, you've got to be careful. You know, if you end up with a new use that comes along and reprices the commodity, it often ends up destroying the demand that was present for that commodity before the new use came along. Yeah. And so then that element of supply that was being sold to, for that use has to be absorbed uh, by Absolutely. the new demand plus the new supply. Uh, and, and if there isn't enough net new demand to accommodate both the, the new production as well as where the product used to be going, then you end up with these huge price falls. And so we're very conscious of that. And, and I, I just think if I go back in history, back in the 1980s, a lot of the oil companies invested substantial amounts of money in the mining space. Um, it, it, to some extent, it's a little bit uh, similar here where you're seeing the auto companies investing directly in the raw material 
with regards to lithium, particularly out of China so far, maybe with the Germans coming in soon. Um, do you see that as a, as, as a, as a requirement uh, from their point of view? Is it, is, it, is, it, is it something that will last the whole way through, shall we say, in your opinion, for the next 10 years? Or is it something which is just a much shorter term situation? Yeah, it's a good question. I, mean, I remember when uh, palladium uh, prices shot up and there was a squeeze and palladium became known as unobtainium. And you know, you, you, people are now starting to say the same is going to happen in cobalt. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can read the newspapers and you see the headlines, whether it's Volkswagen and the latest one, BMW, looking to secure um, long-term supply of cobalt to be able to just to meet their demands. Mm -hmm. But I think the memory of the auto companies is still fresh about the losses that they took from buying physical positions mm -hmm. um, in order to guarantee their supply. So I think they might be a bit cautious around that. Um, and I guess also the price is still being, the discovery process on price is still happening right now um, because we're still, we're incredibly early. Yeah. You, know, you know, EV sales, um, well, EV including hybrid sales are less than one, well, about 1% 1 of auto sales yeah. today. So this is a tiny market. You know, okay, so you might be at 7 to 15% in, in, uh, in uh, seven years' time from now, yeah, which is enormous growth. And there isn't going to be enough supply of some commodities to accommodate that for the battery need on its own. Um, so I think you, you don't need to take too much risk uh, here to get a good rate of return. And that's the kind of what we've gone for. Okay. Uh, I, I feel with two uh, people standing there looking at us, uh, I'm assuming uh, time <laughs> is uh, probably up. Uh, and I know this is probably the, almost certainly the hottest ticket in the mining mines of money because all the uh, other uh, A-starred uh, uh, fund managers are sitting in the anteroom listening to uh, Evie talk on this, so uh, uh, as for their next uh, 12 months' uh, opinion. So um, on that, I think I'd probably better leave it, and I think on behalf of Evie and I, I'd like to thank Man Minds yeah. of Money uh, for an excellent conference, and I hope everyone enjoys it, and uh, thank you for uh, having us, uh, uh, having the chance to have this uh, second of maybe many uh, fireside chats. Brilliant. So thank you very much. Indeed. Thank you.